Welcome to this video on statistical mechanics. My name is Jos Dason and I've made this video together with a few others for my course in statistical mechanics, which I teach at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. This movie deals with polymers and it's part of a series. In a previous movie I have discussed freely jointed chains and Gaussian chains. In all cases we model the polymers as beads connected by links. In uh, the previous movies, these uh, links were rigid, they had a rigid length, and apart from that there were no constraints, no interactions whatsoever. In this movie I want to discuss the case where the beads cannot overlap, and that's obviously a realistic case, and we shall calculate what the behavior is of the radius of gyration as a function of the number of beads, and we shall analyze those results for different dimensions. I hope the movie is useful. We consider a polymer in two dimensions. It's represented here as a set of beads. Those are the white circles and they are connected by links. And the links are flexible with respect to the beads, but they themselves are rigid and have a fixed length of A. And the white circles are the beads which cannot overlap. So if I would draw, for example, an extra bead attached to this first or last bead, then it cannot, this new bead could not overlap with this bead, for example. We want to find the radius of gyration, Rg, as a function of the number of beads in the polymer. And we have seen in a previous movie that for a free, freely jointed chain, the Rg scales with the square root of the number of beads, n. So what about this case? Here we have the, the beads that do not want to overlap and that may change the behavior of Rg. Before starting the actual calculation of Rg, let's think about the effect of the hard core interaction between the beads for different dimensions. We start with the simplest problem, that's a one dimensional chain. And for the one dimensional chain, I can take a bead and I place the bead on the chain and then I move over to a next bead, a second bead. I can put this at the right and then the third one can be either placed on a distance, on the same distance, let's call it A, to the right or it would overlap with the first one but because of the hard core interaction that would not be possible. So the third bead will be placed over here, the fourth bead over there, etc. So what we expect for DS1 is that the RG would scale with the number of beats. So that's for the 1D problem. In 2D we have many more possibilities than in 1D, but we see that it's easy for the beats to overlap. So the effect of the interactions is uh, expected to be really significant in 2BD. If you imagine a three-dimensional structure, which is here hard to draw, then you can imagine that it's easier for the beads to avoid each other. So what we expect is that the effect of the hardcore interaction, which prevents the bead from overlapping, decreases with increasing dimension. It's also useful to be aware of a kind of benchmark for our results, and that benchmark is the case where there is no interaction, so if there is no hardcore interaction, it's repulsion, that corresponds to the freely jointed chain, and we have seen that in that case the Rg scales with the square root of the number of beats. What we want to find out is whether in 1D, 2D, 3D, etc., whether we find still the same result or whether perhaps the exponent changes. So we could envisage two effects. There could be a prefactor before the end which changes when you change the when you switch on the hardcore repulsion. The other effect could be that it is this exponent changes. So let's start the calculation then. 
And we start by noting that in the van der Waals theory we have a very similar situation where we have particles which have a hard core and so they don't want to overlap. And that manifests itself in a, an excluded volume for each particle pair. There we had seen that we could calculate the effect of the repulsive interaction in the partition function in the following way. We need to evaluate this integral over all the positions of the particles occurring in this potential. And for the first particle due to translation invariance, we just can put it everywhere in the volume V, so we get a V. All these positions Ri live in this volume V. For the second particle, we have an excluded volume. So we have V minus B, where B is the excluded volume. For the third one, that needs to avoid the first two particles. So we have V minus 2B. And we carry on up to and including the V minus NB. This term represents the contribution of the, the repulsive interaction to the partition function. So we can safely write this in the form e to the power minus beta f repulsion, which is the contribution to the, f to the free energy of the repulsive interactions. We can find an explicit expression for this repulsive part of the free energy by taking the logarithm on both sides. We use the fact that uh, beta, as usual, is given as 1 over kBt. And then we find that the F repulsion is kBt with a minus sign times the logarithm of the product that we had up here. The logarithm of the product of all these terms becomes the sum of the logarithms of each terms and we can replace the sum by an integral and that's what we have done here and we can do this integral. Here is the result v minus xb times log v minus xb minus v minus xb and we have to evaluate that for 0 and for n. We then arrive at this expression here. And in order to make progress, we assume that the particle overlap volume, which is nb, that it is much smaller than v. And then we can write the logarithm. of v minus nb as the logarithm of v minus nb over v minus n squared b squared over 2 v squared. We have performed now the second order Taylor expansion of the logarithm. And then the expression that we had here turns into the expression in the last line here. And then combining all the terms we find the following. And we see that in this expression we can cancel the b which is here in the denominator against the b occurring in each of these terms. And then we see that the first and the last term no longer depend on B. In fact, they are part of the partition function of an ideal gas, so they are not really related to the repulsion. They are always there. And the terms related to the repulsion are these two. And as you can see, they are of the same form, except one term occurs with a plus one and the other one with a minus one half. And so in the end, we will use for the repulsive energy the following expression. F repulsion is kBt times n squared b divided by 2v. But this is a bit puzzling. What should we use for v? If we would put the polymer in a very, very large volume, the effect of the repulsion would decrease. And that's, of course, not what we expect, because the, vol the, the, the polymer has its own volume, and within that volume there may be overlaps. 
so this V is not the volume in which we put place the uh, the polymer but it's the volume which is occupied by the polymer and the best guess that we have for our V would be to take the radius of gyration raised to the power d because that's the volume which is occupied by the polymer and therefore we can replace this by kbt n squared b divided by 2 radius of gyration raised to the power d and that completes the calculation of the repulsive part of the free energy the repulsive part is such that the polymer wants to stretch in order to make the Rg larger and that reduces the value of the repulsive free energy and that occurs with a positive sign and the free energy always wants to be as small as possible. So there is a tendency for the poly polymer to stretch. However, if the polymer really stretches out, the entropy usually goes down because it doesn't have enough leeway to put the individual links. It doesn't have as many opportunities to put the links wherever it wants. And therefore we see a reduction in the entropy. So we need another term which represents this entropy. And if we then recall that we have looked at a free chain or a Gaussian chain, they are equivalent, the two, then we realized that that was a chain which only had entropy effects and no repulsive effects. So we are going to consider now the free energy for the Gaussian chain in order to represent the entropy effects. And we will include those in addition to this repulsive part of the free energy. In the previous movie which dealt with free and Gaussian chains we have calculated a partition function of a Gaussian chain with a fixed position of the first and the nth beat, the zeroth and the nth beat, and we found this result over here. So if we take kt times the logarithm of this expression then we have the free energy. Realizing that this end-to-end -end distance is proportional to the radius of gyration, we would just replace it now by the radius of gy gyration, and then we obtain this expression for the Gaussian free energy. And the total free energy is then the sum of these two contributions, the repulsive and the Gaussian free energy. F first, we note that the two terms both contain a factor of kBT. And in fact, that has a, the, re, the reason for this is that, for example, for the repulsive interaction, we have either infinite or we have zero. And therefore, there is no intermediate energy. So it, the result of the partition function cannot depend on kT. But if we then derive a free energy from the partition function, then we arrive at this factor. And for the free chain, it's the same. Also, the energy there is either zero or it's infinite and therefore it also has a kind of artificial kbt dependence and both terms have the same kbt dependence and uh, that's beneficial because what we want to know is the behavior for rg and we can find that by just taking the derivative and then the kbt factors do not matter if we take the derivative of uh, the free energy with respect to Rg, we have the following two terms deriving from those two terms over here. And I have, uh, represent, I have written the n and the Rg dependence in black and the coefficients that are in the end not interesting to us. I've uh, written those in green. So we have a term n squared divided by Rg to the power d plus 1. Note the minus sign here, that's important. And then we have an Rg over n times uh, some constant. This derivative must be put equal to 0 because we are after a stationary point for the free energy. And then we find the following dependence of Rg. We find that Rg raised to the power d plus 2 is proportional to n to the third. In other words, we find that Rg scales with n to the power 3 over d plus 2. 
and this is the so-called Flory exponent. Let us analyze this uh, exponent for different dimensions. First of all, we had anticipated already at the start of this movie that Rg would be proportional to n in one dimension, and indeed, for d is 1, we find that the Rg is proportional to n. Then we carry on with d is 2, for which we find that the radius of gyration scales as n to the power 3 over 4. For d is 3, the radius of gyration scales with n to the power 3 over 5. For d is 4, we find that the radius of gyration scales with the square root of the number of particles. That's in fact the same as for a chain which does not interact, the free chain or the Gaussian chain. So apparently the effect of the uh, repulsive interaction ceases to influence the scaling behavior beyond d is 4. Here you see the result of a computer simulation of uh, polymers in two dimensions and uh, these stars are the points which matter. They show you the radius of gyration squared versus the number of beats and the dotted line represents the theoretical result which uh, corrected for the length gives you n minus 1 to the power 1.5 and we had found for the Flory theory that Rg indeed scales like n to the power 3 halves, so rg squared gives us here the correct exponent. And it's uh, of course an interesting problem why the uh, Flory result works that well. After all, we have followed uh, parts of the van der Waals theory, we have used results for a Gaussian chain, and they are both approximations, and uh, the van der Waals theory is known to work not very well for two dimensions, so why does it give such excellent results here? Well, there has been a lot of research into this question, and uh, it turns out that the approximations that we have made both in the repulsive part of the free energy and in the Gaussian part, that these approximations somehow subtle, in a subtle way cancel each other. And therefore the final result is the correct result. It's believed to be exact. So we have seen a very powerful way of calculating the scaling behavior of the radius of gyration of a polymer in which the beads do not want to overlap. And this is known as the Flory exponent, the Flory theory. And we have uh, checked the Flory exponents for different dimensions. We have uh, studied them uh, linear in one dimension, three quarters in two dimensions. So you can see that here in the result of this simulation. I don't have a simulation for three dimensions, but also there it's uh, uh, the agreement turns out to be quite accurate. And in four dimensions, we cross over to the uh, un un not interacting chain, so for example a Gaussian chain or a free chain.